been called a novelty detector, and it normally has burst firing. So if you're sitting and your neighbor drops something next to you on the floor, your locus cerulea starts bursting because something novel happened in your environment. Psychedelics amplify that. They don't change the way these cells fire normally, but if something happens, it causes them to burst fire. They, in, they really increase their firing even more. So we could imagine that things in the environment that would normally seem very familiar would seem very novel after a psychedelic. And the ventral tegmental area sends dopamine to the cortex, and dopamine resistance is responsible for cognition and short-term memory processing. So all these different sites in the brain that are critical for processing sensory information and how we perceive the environment and how we interpret it, I keep backing up so as not to be too loud, <clears throat> all are affected by psychedelics. So it's a really interesting, rich target pharmacologically. And many people in neuroscience are studying serotonin and serotonin receptors now as a direct consequence of the discovery of LSD in the 40s. <clears throat> Now this, this is going to be really hard to see, unfortunately. Let me see if I can read it off the screen. So I tried to think, what are some of the key events that have occurred in this renaissance with respect to public perception and in the science community? And what you can't see is the first three dates up there are 1963, when Walter Ponky completed his PhD thesis which was called the Good Friday Experiment, as we know. In 1969, Alexander Shulgin published a paper called Structure Activity Relationships of One Ring Psychotomimetics. And in 1970, Walter Pankey and Groff et al. published the first paper on LSD use in terminal patients. Now that's sort of the anchor, I would say, of the Renaissance. If we think of the 60s as being sort of a just being walloped by psychedelics and then everything being shut off by the legal repression, sort of the beginning of the re Renaissance really has to stretch back to some anchor points. And those are the ones I identify. When I started graduate school in 1969, I'd memorized everything that Sasha Shogun had done. And he published that paper in 1969. And I went to graduate school to be a psychedelic chemist. And there really weren't any others, by the way, and there still aren't. Um, <clears throat> so. The studies of dying patients that were related to the Good Friday experiment really went back to Eric Kass' work in the 1950s. But that was an inspiration for a lot of people today. As you'll hear from Roland Griffiths and other people, the Good Friday experiment was a case where we could look at a psychedelic and say, here's where they seem to have really worked. You hear lots about creativity. LSD enhances creativity. LSD does this. LSD is useful for treating substance abuse, et cetera. When you're in science, you have to have proof. And if you want to prove that psychedelics are useful, what do you look at? What do you really have that's well documented? And the treatment of dying patients was one of the most well documented things that we could look at and say, it seems to have worked there. So these are sort of anchor points. So if we move down the list, what I basically have told people is I make tools for pharmacologists. I make chemical tools to study how things happen in the brain. So <clears throat> I went to graduate school in 1969. In 1973, I developed a method for making the isomers of amphetamines, psych psychedelic amphetamines. Up to that point in time, it was very difficult to get the pure isomers. In 1984, there was an Esalen conference, which I believe Rick Doblin helped to fund, although I'm not sure. And there was a group there called ARUPA, the uh, Association for the Responsible Use of Psychedelic Agents. Uh, responsible use was probably not the correct term for that conference, but that was a conference where uh, a lot of people got together that had a common interest in particularly in preventing MDMA from being scheduled as a controlled substance. And I met a lot of people at that conference who uh, are, are figures in the movement today, Sasha, Rick Strassman, George Greer, a lot of people who made fundamental contributions to raising public awareness. Rick Doblin was also there. Uh, in 1984, Rick Doblin uh, founded Earth Metabolic Labs as, a, as the beginning of what eventually evolved into MAPS. And then in the spring there was a second conference where I met with Rick Strassman and we started strategizing how he could do a clinical study with DMT. And lots of people at the Esalen conferences were telling me you can never do psychedelic research, the government will never allow it. And I told Rick Strassman I didn't really believe that. 
I just thought it required somebody who really had the tenacity and perseverance. You couldn't, probably couldn't get funding from the government, but you could do that work if you wanted to. So we began a dialogue which eventually led to him getting approval to do a study with DMT. In 1986, Rick Doblin came to me and said, I want to make MDMA into a drug, but I can't find anybody to make the drug. They want too much money or they won't even make it. Can you do it? And I was actually pretty stupid at the time, and I said, sure. Um, I worked with the FDA, and we made two kilograms of FDA-certified MDMA. Um, that's the MDMA that's still used screensaver. That's the MD MDMA that's still used today for all the clinical studies. Uh, of MDMA. Now the screen server is actually activated, screen saver is activated and I see nothing here. I see exactly what you see there. Okay. So <clears throat> in 1986 George and Rick Greer published their paper on the use of MDMA in couples therapy. And as a result of the conferences in 1985, I became aware of the fact that MDMA was unlikely to ever become a real medicine. Rick Doblin continues to move in that direction, more power to him. But I, at that time, I was not convinced that that would happen because the drug had its genesis in the recreational drug scene. So I tried to find ways to carve out a niche for the class of drugs that would allow them to be developed as therapeutics. And <clears throat> at that time, the DEA and the for enforcement officials were calling MDMA an another hallucinogenic amphetamine. And I didn't believe it was another hallucinogenic amphetamine, so I set out to prove that. With science, we showed it wasn't simply a hallucinogenic amphetamine, and I named the category intactogens, partly as a political move, but partly also as a pharmacological tact, that it was different. It wasn't a hallucinogen in the sense that we understood hallucinogens. So um, in 1986, Rick Doblin founded MAPS. That also has to be a major uh, move forward in terms of this uh, so-called renaissance. And then in 1990, I synthesized the first batch of DMT for Rick Strassman for his DMT study. Um, after he and I met with Danny Friedman several times and mapped out the strategy for doing the studies, Rick Strassman said to me, well, what if I get all the approvals and I can't get anybody to make the drug? And that's exactly what happened again, as was the case with uh, Rick Doblin and MDMA. No one wanted to make the DMT for him. Uh, the, the closest estimate I think he got was $10,000. And that was sort of guess, and then that company backed out. So he came to me and said, okay, will you do it? And I reluctantly agreed, and we made him the first batch of DMT for $300. Um, it's a bargain even today at that price. <clears throat> I think it was $300 for four grams. So I don't know, maybe you can buy it on the street cheaper than that, but probably not. <clears throat> so then uh, Sasha published uh, Pical, and everyone here knows of P what Pical is. So now you're starting, people are starting, even the people, people in the sort of subculture, everyone knew who Sasha was, and so, okay, Sasha's long-awaited book came out, yada, yada, yada. But then a lot of people started buying it that you didn't expect to have buy it. Sasha said when the DEA raided his labs, a lot of DEA agents had copies of Bikal, they wanted him to ins inscribe for him. <laughs> so <clears throat> that was a big, um, that was sort of a big, public relations thing, and people started buying it off Amazon who never really were that interested before they'd hear about Pical. What's that? It was a very reasonably priced book. As you all know, Sasha self-published. It was like $17 or $18. Unbelievable for a book that was a thousand pages or so long. So that was another landmark. <clears throat> um, in 1993, I decided to found the Hefter Research Institute. Now, when I went to graduate school in 1969, I would tell people, you know, you could do research on these. Just because the government stopped funding it doesn't mean you can't do research. You just need private money. And I would go to scientific meetings and sit with people, and we'd have a beer, and I'd say, you know, you only need a million dollars. That's how long ago it was. Now it would be 20 or 30 million to do what I was proposing. So I kept telling the same stale story over and over and over. And then around 1992, I said, you know, I'm going to be 75 or 80 years old, retired, sitting in a rocking chair, telling the same story. And so I got a bunch of psychiatrists, George Greer and Charlie Grobe and Dennis McKenna and Phil Wilson and a lot of colleagues and said, let's do this thing. I hadn't done it because I didn't have an MD and I thought you really need to give the drugs to humans. And that was something that I couldn't do. So we started the Hefter Institute specifically to support uh, scientific research but in a scientific context because I always believed that we really need to gain legitimacy in mainstream science and everything would follow if we could get acceptance there. And of course, by then, I was a full professor, 